Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Royson, and welcome to a special edition, in my mind, of Live Your Best Life. I am super excited always to bring you people, places, things, information, resources, and tools to help inspire you and empower you to live your best life. So I am in a writer's heaven right at this moment because uh, one of my uh, mentors, coaches, admirers I am interviewing today is my special guest. And so it is just over the top. So I'll, I'm going to try to contain myself and not be a giddy groupie. <laughs> um, but I'm super excited um, to have my guest, Miss Betty Winston Baye, with me today. And if you're a writer, go and get your pen and paper because she's going to be dropping uh boulders today not just little nuggets she's gonna be dropping boulders because that's just of uh, the kind of person she is so miss betty i want you to introduce yourself tell us where you're from and tell us where we can find you on facebook or social media besides facebook because i don't yeah you, you you know all those things that you said mentor whatever but really you are my friend <laughs> Thank you. Yay! Absolutely dear to me. And I think that our meeting through uh, Hannah Drake's introduction, um, since we met in the cafe and had lunch, it has been uh, special ever since. And I, I realized that, um, you know, my last book, The Book of David, my East Harlem love story, um, you really got me to the finish line. And uh, it was a very difficult time for me. Uh, my sweetheart had died and I had this story and you really said, okay, let's get it. Cause I would have still been writing the book if you had not pushed me. So I consider you uh, a friend and also an ally, you know, on this writing journey. And as a writer yourself, you know, that sometimes, you know, it's, it's not what you do with a whole group of people. I mean, it's a, it's a solitary sport. And uh, sometimes you read somebody else's mind because you sit in your house and go crazy. By the way, <laughs> you are in my kitchen, so you all get what you get up there on the counter. It's yeah. Quite like, you know, it should be. But um, yeah, but anyway, I am, um, uh, they called me Little Betty Winston. And, and um, the Baye came later. That came with a husband who is no longer here. It hasn't been for years, but the name is so lovely. Uh, Baye, I love my name. And it means uh, straightforward. Ah. And, uh, I am um, born in uh, New York City, born in Brooklyn. I grew up on the Lower East Side in East Harlem and um, grew up uh, Presbyterian. And I was baptized Episcopalian. I belong to an AME. I, I feel like I am uh, interdenominational. <laughs> and uh, for a long time, I thought I was Jewish. Because <laughs> I lived on the Lower East Side and there was a synagogue um, mm. in the middle of the block and I would run in there and scream. And my, my very best first friend was a little Jewish girl named Deborah. And when my mother was pregnant, uh, I begged her to name my, my, little, my new little sister, Deborah. And she did, mommy did as I asked her. So I always think about Deborah, and um, I tell people, I remember that Deborah's mother had those numbers on her arm. But when I was a kid, I didn't know what that tattoo meant. And years later, you know, I realized after Deborah had gone out of my life because we had moved that uh, Deborah's mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. And wow. I think about Deborah and I wonder where she is. Is she in this world? Is she gone? Um, you know, she was just very special to me as a kid growing up on the Lower East Side. And um, so I, um, you know, had all my education in New York, New York Public Schools, Hunter College, City University of New York. And then I went on to Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. And I was, you know, older then because I didn't go to college until I was 27. So, you know, I was bouncing around. I thought I was going to be Cecily Tyson. I was in the theater. And uh, I worked for the National Committee of Black Churchmen. I worked at one time for OIC and I was a secretary and administrator, you know, executive assistant type. So I have much respect for the girls behind the typewriters. And, um, and as an administrative assistant to, you know, top people, I, I had a lot of power. So when people tried to mistreat the secretary, I would lose their messages until later in the day. You know? <laughs> I just went, what you think of the little people, the janitors, the secretaries, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? 
because they have power. Yes, they do. Um, and I come from, um, you know, my, my, my father was from Virginia, my mother's from Maryland, and they were part of the, the Great Migration back in the 40s. They left. My father hated Virginia, hated the South, and they went to Harlem. They met in Harlem, and um, my father thought he was quite the player, and um, my mom fresh out of high school, out of um, a little segregated Robin Moton High School in Westminster, Maryland, and um, my Aunt Catherine was already up in New York, and you know, and Catherine was partying and everything, my mother's older sister. And my mother said that her and my father, my mother never really drank, never drank, but my father, he liked his cups. And so he was young, he was fine. And um, he said something to my mother, like, you know, um, they were sitting there in the club or something. And he said, well, you know, my, my, my women used to be buy me drinks. So my mother said, well, I guess you won't be drinking tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That got his attention. I know it did. <laughs> like, wait a minute, I am fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but but when I uh, was growing up, you know, um, in East Harlem, my father told me wonderful stories about Harlem. So there's a part of me about his Harlem. I got the tail end of some of that. You know, I was at the Apollo all the time with my friends, and we saw you know, Jackie Wilson and the Temptations and Diana Ross and the Supremes and Bill Cosby and, you know, all these people came, Stevie Wonder, they came to the Apollo Theater. So I had that, but my dad would tell me these wonderful stories about Harlem and how the Negroes dressed up on Sundays. And daddy said, every Sunday was Easter Sunday in Harlem. And he said, people would put on their, you know, their finest and they'd stroll down 7th Avenue. Wow. I had this image that my father was a good storyteller. All these Black people just walking, just beautiful, just out of the South, you know. Um, and my, my dad and mom, you know, they would go to the Savoy Ballroom. And my mother was a good dancer. My daddy wasn't quite as good a dancer. And he said, one night, honey, the band was playing. And he said, your mother was dancing with some, you know what. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, the song stopped. And, you know, the song was over. But mom and the guy were waiting for the next song. So they standing in the middle of the floor. My father said, he went to my mother and said, I think you better come over here and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> they were waiting for the next song. <laughs> my father was this great storyteller. And um, for a long time, my family didn't even have a television. And um, so my father was like Saturday night entertainment. Yeah. He just told the best stories. And he and my mom were like this wonderful, you know, combination of people. My mother, um, was a high school graduate and my father um, said about my mother, he said, you know, a man should never have a child with every woman he lays down with. Cause he said, ignorant women raise ignorant children. Oh, wow. And, and I wanted somebody to help my children with the ABCs and so, and their mathematics. And because daddy only went to the seventh grade, he had a high respect for education. Mm. And he, he uh, was a voracious reader of newspapers. and. And uh, never dreaming I would have this career, but I'm the oldest. I'm seven years older than one sister and I'm 10 years older than the other. So I had a different father and mother than, than my sisters had. And I always believe it's because when your parents are younger, they have dreams. Yes. So they, you know, daddy, mommy was 19, dad was 22 or 21, and they had bigger dreams. And I think that by the time my sisters came, the world had interrupted. You know, it was like, it wasn't going to be magic. You, you know what I'm saying? And so I think I got them when they were dreamers. And my dad, especially, was a dreamer. And he put those dreams into me. So for them, me graduating from high school, Benjamin Franklin High School in East Harlem, was a big deal. And it wasn't about college. It was about, you know, you finish high school, and then you go to work. And plus the schools, you know, my generation of Black people, they trained us to work for other people. Right. Not to be entrepreneurs, you know, not to be, I mean, some of us did, but I was trained to be a secretary. Mm -hmm. And my big dream, I was telling my friends uh, yesterday, we had a homegirl call, um, that my big dream was to work at the United Nations. I wanted to be a secretary at the United Nations down on uh, 40, 42nd Street. And they gave me a test. I won the typing award from high school and the stenography award. I, very, I was very good, very fast. And they gave me the test on like a foreign typewriter. And it had all these, I don't know what that was, but I guess I wasn't, I wasn't meant to go into the, uh, you know, the diplomatic thing, which I really wanted to, to do. 
And uh, when you grow up in New York, you grow up with everybody. So I never really had that sort of black experience with, you know, get off the sidewalk and all of that. I heard enough from the people that raised me because I say I was raised by up South people. We lived like we were in the South, <laughs> you know, we shared stuff and all of that. But um, so I really grew up in a, in, a, in a big world of all different people. And I knew that, you know, this whole notion of white people are smart and black people are dumb. I went to school with them, I went in their houses. So I did not grow up with that notion that somebody was better than me or smarter than mm -hmm. me or, mm -hmm. or any of that. And, um, uh, and which was my father's full intention. So, um, but it's like almost everything that sort of seemed to happen in my life, it was happened. It didn't, it wasn't a plan. Yeah, I didn't right. plan to live in Louisville, you know, New right. York, my home. I'm you know, like, well, who who lands in Louisville unless they're forced to from a job? So I guess yeah. my first my first question is for any young person out there, do you advise would you advise someone to just remain open and um more pliable? Because today, you know, you fit in a box, you know. Most people, well, uh, and until the pandemic, but most people are, you know, I want to be a lawyer and that's it, or I want to be a this and I and that's it. And I don't know whether that is really so good as much as continue to grow and always be willing to grow and expand. Yeah. I, well, I didn't move as much as some of my friends. I mean, they were really, they really are nomads. But I thought I would live in New York all my life. And I think if my father hadn't died, I probably would not have been in Louisville. My father didn't want anything to do with nothing, nothing in the South. If, I, if my father was alive and I told him they had a Confederate monument down there by the university, he would say, what? Yeah. Oh, so, um, but you know, it's interesting because Louisville tried to register. The first place I ever flew to on an airplane was to Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. I was 17, I was working for the United Presbyterian Church, which is now headquartered here. And I was a secretary and they had a, a general assembly here. And I had never been on an airplane. And I flew here. I think it was the old Sheraton Hotel. Mm -hmm. I had never stayed in a hotel before. It was in Louisville, Kentucky. It was the year that the Presbyterians elected their first Black moderator. So, I mean, I had, and, and Louisville is also the place where I had my incident where a very a, a, a minister that I respected, um, because I took shorthand, he invited me, or he asked me, he wanted to give me some dictation. And uh, he said he would do it after the meeting and come to my room. Well, really, it turned into like he was trying to attack me. Wow. 17 years old. My mother's in New York. And uh, my mother, I called, I was so shaken. I finally got him out of my room. But I never said anything to anybody about that. And because, you know, who would believe me? I'm the, right. I'm the clerk, you know. And um, and I remember I, I called my mother. And my mother said, baby, I'm so far away. What can I do? She said, just stay away from him. And when I saw that man, the rest of the thing, he act like he didn't even know who I was. Wow. You know, but it was a struggle to get him out of my room. And, and I think I suppressed that memory for like a long time. That happened to me in Louisville. Louisville was the first place I ever flew. When I became a journalist in 81, the National Association of Black Journalists met here in Louisville, Kentucky. I came to the convention. I, my hand is up in every session and the da 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 da. And I met the uh, Carol Sutton, who was like a big, the first woman big editor at the Courier Journal. She liked me. And I was working at a newspaper in Mount Vernon, New York, home of Denzel Washington and other, you know. Woo woo. And um, <laughs> she stayed in touch with me for the next three or four years because I was just really right out of school. And, um, and then in 84, she invited me to come for an interview. The day I came for an interview, a beloved reporter at the Courier Journal had died that day. Nobody wanted to be bothered with me talking to me. And uh, finally, John Filiatro, bless his heart, who uh, I think John died last year. Um, uh, John took me out to lunch. And, and I'm not sure everybody there wanted me to come, but I got here in 84 and I came on Carol's suggestion. And when I came here, I was traumatized because. It was, it was not New York. Mm -mm. And uh, no. my girlfriend brought me here and she looked around the skyline, basically the boathouse. And she yes. said, 
He said, I, girl, I can't leave you here. What is this place? <laughs> so they had not developed the waterfront. It was all sand. You couldn't even see the river. Right. I thought it was the Mississippi River. You yeah, know? you didn't know it was the Ohio. <laughs> and uh, so I really um, was here. And I was going home like, you know, every weekend or something, literally. And finally, uh, one of the journalists here at Murph Austin told me, he said, you know, you have to mentally unpack. And once I sort of got comfortable and made some friends, I was able to sort of make the transition, but I never dreamed that I would live in Louisville this long. Wow. You know, people ask me, are you going back to New York? I said, and live where? <laughs> and of course, the cost of living and everything is so vast. Exactly. exactly. Friends and everything. Well, we love that you live in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I was telling before we started recording that uh, I was doing a, a, a writing class and uh, I mentioned her name and, and, and the young lady said, you actually know Miss Betty Baye? Oh my gosh, you act, you know, you published Miss Betty Baye? I was like, yes. So she is the Louisville, Kentucky um, celebrity. So when you hear somebody say something like, like, oh my gosh, that's so great. What does, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, first of all, it's humbling. And second of all, everybody that knows me know that, you know, I'm just not into that. <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, um, it, it, it's like weird. You know, it's just sort of, look, I'm the girl from the projects in New York City. <laughs> Everything that happens to me is God's gift. You know, like it's only God because it's almost as if, like you said, some people grow up and they know what they want to be. I was experimenting and this was wonderful because, you know, it was young, gifted in black 60s, right? Right. So, I was like, it was a wonderful time to be black. And so I was finding my gifts, you know, what am I doing, you know? And I was in places I wasn't supposed to be in, but it turned out I was in places too where history were made with people who now are like legends. And these are people that I sat with, you know, I went to the poetry slams, I, I did all of that. It was just a wonderful experience. And I think, if, you know, for some, for some reason, I think it was God's intention that I not go to college right out of high school. Cause that would have been totally different. I got to live this wonderful life, you know, and be a young woman working in these places, meeting these amazing people, civil rights people, you know, entertainers, uh, being with Barbara Ann Tier in the National Black Theater, you know, playing the Apollo with Little Richard, uh, which was quite an experience. Um, so I had all these experiences, you know, seeing Malcolm X in the flesh, wow. you know, seeing him out there on 125th Street. Um, you know, uh, okay. So I had to stop you because you know I'm like, we just saw it in the movies. We didn't get this. You know, I was born in in '63, so I was too young to even yeah, realize. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I was born in 1963, so I'm like, what was that like to actually? Well, I, I guess my biggest thing: how close was Denzel to the actual man? Well, I, uh, they, you know, they all get glimpses of him. My friend my late friend Les Payne has a new book out and everybody should get it. The Dead Are Rising, which is really, uh, it just won the National Book Award, but his daughter Tam Tamara Payne finished the book for him. Les is, gives you other insights into who Malcolm was because, you know, people know him as a, you know, sort of a figure, you know, you almost become not human. And Les tells you how he grew up and his mother and, you know, things that we don't often get to hear about Malcolm. We get to hear the speeches, but you get the world that shaped him. But he was just a man. And he, um, you know, had this epiphany when he came into the Nation of Islam. You know, Nation was good for getting all the drug addicts and the prisoners and the, put them suits on them and they out there selling bean pies and Muhammad speaks and stuff. Um, but all of these people, you know, the Larry Neals, the Mary Barakas, the, you know, the poets and the writers, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Haki Matabudi, Don Lee, we were like all together because I was in the National Black Theater. And so, you know, the last poets, uh, Felipe Luciano, Garland Kane, David Nelson, all of these people. And I still was finding myself. I was not a writer yet. And I tried to write a little poetry because I thought I wanted to be Nikki. And I remember somebody wrote a poem and the entire poem was black. <laughs> I mean, we were like, yeah, but I said, I can't write that. I don't know what that is. My poetry <laughs> is horrible. I found some of it. And so I think God was still working with me, yeah. you know, 
but he was exposing me. And through SNCC, you know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you know, working with Rat Brown, H. Rat Brown, um, uh, you know, James Foreman. Uh, I mean, these brilliant, young, brave people um, really, I think, shaped my life. And then all those Black preachers, you know, that I worked with, you know, Gay Ward Wilmore, uh, Mitz Rollins, who were with Dr. King. And see, when you said you were born in 63, it's the year I came out of high school. But 63 is a very significant year. It was the year of the March on Washington. It was the year that the girls were killed in Birmingham, Alabama in the church. It was the year that, that John F. Kennedy was assassinated on my sister's birthday. In fact, November 22nd, 63 is very significant in the life of black people and the life of black America because it was sort of a turning point. And I'm 17 and I'm coming out into this world where all of this stuff is going on. You know, I'm from the little girl Emmett Till saw that picture you know, in the Jet magazine. Right. And how all of that shaped my life, but how my father and my mother, through God's sake, were in New York and I was spared some of that. Yes. But I was able, I had friends, Ralph Featherstone, who worked in Mississippi, uh, Muhammad Kenyatta, all of these people, when you do civil rights history, they're all there and they were yeah. my friends, mm -hmm. you know, and I would just sit in the rooms and listen to them. When James Cone, um, Dr. James Cone did uh, the, uh, Black Liberation Theology, the book that became, you know, the cornerstone of, you know, the Black theology liberation movement. I would, I was in the rooms with James and in the rooms with my boss, Leon Watts, and they would argue theology. They would argue theology like people sitting in the bar, you know, talking about- The game, the they game would, on Sunday. Yeah. They would say, so I had this wonderful life. So becoming a journalist, when I became a journalist, I was full blown with experiences, which made me for some places not hireable because um, you know, one guy asked me, he said, um, did I think I could be objective covering black people? And I you knew I wasn't gonna get the job. And I said, no, everybody knows only white people can be objective. What does that what? mean? Yeah. I just gave Columbia University this money to get this master's degree. Surely I know how to write a story, but I don't have to be objective. I don't have to be objective. What I have to be is fair. Yes. Because what you feel, you feel. You know, so that, you know, I was able to interview the Klan's members because when I got to Louisville, they were Klansmen on the um, Jefferson County Police Force. I did those stories. And I will tell you that we are, this, what we're doing now is really, that's been coming. That's been coming with all the insurrection at the White House because from, um, I was reading something the other day in the Smithsonian Magazine about, the 1919, bloody 1919. And all across the country, black people were being persecuted. So when, you know, for trying to, to, to do what everybody else did, come to America and, mer and make it. You know, they burned us out. They, they killed us, they lynched us. They, you know, it was like everything. And what you see now is a resurrection of something that's been, because every, one, every 100 years or so, white people have a meltdown and they decide, that nobody's supposed to have nothing. So people say this is because they see the demographics changing, but, but white folks was doing this in early 20th century when they were the majority, when we were just trying to have our little grocery stores and you know what I'm saying? And they, and they would plant bombs and kill our people. And, and sadly, you know, I was talking to a guy the other day um, who's also from New York in construction and we were talking and I said, you know, I grew up with Italians and Germans and all of these people before they became white people. Right. I mean, they were, they were all of these different groups and they were struggling like us. And they, you know, the unions didn't want them. They had to fight. They were said that they were nasty and that they were lazy, all of those ethnic groups. And then that second generation became white people. And once mm -hmm. they became like white people is when they had to find somebody else to step down. On. So most of them don't even know their own history their own history. They're right here in Louisville in 1855. They had a riot against the Catholics and the immigrants. The Protestants attacked them. You see what I'm saying? Right. But they don't know that history. So here they are a couple of generations later looking down on black people and their people were the nasty people, the immigrant people, the ones that want to come and take over and take, take the other people's jobs. But now they just like white people. So once they got that whiteness in their mind, and then for black people, it became colorism. 
yes. it becomes the lightest, you know. And if you light or if you're mixed, you automatically the pretty one. Right. You, know, you see a lot of our older people. Ooh, she got good hair. You know, ooh, you got good hair. Mm -hmm. And when I was coming along as a dark skinned girl, a lot of the dark skinned boys, their mothers wasn't trying to have them see me. You know what I'm saying? Because the idea was to get lighter. So this idea of whiteness, you know what I'm saying? It's the thing that messes with everybody's head. It makes white folks crazy. It makes black folks crazy. <laughs> and all of these people getting to try to be white. Right. It's Instead of it celebrating who, who they really, really are. I mean, even when I was still teaching, I had two little girls get into a fight. And they were both black. And one was calling the one the inside of a peanut butter uh, uh, and the other one Reese's peanut butter and the other one said, but you the outside. And they got into a major brawl about that. And I'm like, this is crazy business. I'm the black teacher, two black kids. I'm mad at both of you. And, uh, but, the, but of course the, the young white teachers were like, I didn't understand why what the fight is about and i'm like are you sure you're ready for it are you sure you're ready for me to tell you the reason yeah. and she said oh i never would have known that i said i know because you're too young i said but they're younger than you are and they're still having the fight from uh, from slavery i mean you know just from they got it and they got it from inside their house in their house and they keep on passing it down it just it down. keeps on colorism, going it keeps on going colorism is still here and uh, now that we have more, um, you know, interracial, I mean, where it's just right out in the open, um, I suspect that pretty soon in order to keep the number of white people up, they will start adopting the interracial people as white people. Yeah. Because the white people made the standards and said, if you got a drop of black blood, you're black. You're black. Right. Now they have discounted themselves because there's more and more of them coming. Yeah. And, you know, I tell my friends, I said, you know, growing up, today, when I look at like the stars and the videos and all that stuff, there's a lot of people who look very close to white, not too dark. The dark skinned girls are almost never the star of the videos unless they're the singer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No. But when I came along, I was fortunate that when I looked up, when I went to Apollo, I saw Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bells. I saw Diana Ross. I saw those people that look like me, Gladys yeah, Knight. Yeah, right that to be a dark-skinned child in 2021 when we're moving toward more interracial things and you look at who's getting the parts in the movies and who's doing the whatever you you know a parent of a dark-skinned children you really have to work to make sure that they understand their beauty yes yeah. more and more they're sort of disappearing right. I, was, I looked at something where they had the basketball players and their wives and NBA players and their girlfriends. And I said, you know, it's interesting to me. These young black men, they shout out their mothers all the time on the TV. My mom, you know, she raised me, she took me to the games and are usually mothers, you know, and the mother supported their hoop dreams. And then they get in the NBA and, and hardly anybody's wife looked like their mama. Right. They, you know, right. What, what was, what is up with that? I mean, what is up with that? I, I, I always, I mean, I even look at the Kardashians. I'm not mad at them. I just wonder, I see black men standing online like they're going into the men's bathroom to get to a Kardashian. And I'm like, really? It, it, you know, with, with all of the fake lips, butts and everything, that's what, you know what I'm saying? Well, so but it's, it's been portrayed as the best. I mean, the, it's the, the media has said it, the, you know, and then even your family says it and we exactly. all, you know, we all embrace it. And therefore, and so when I'm writing children's books, I have to make sure that I have all hues. I have to make sure that the little girl who, um, the, the dark skinned girl with the two pom-poms is there as well as the little uh, interracial child with the long curls and all of that. I, I have to make sure that they're all there because they want to see themselves and they want to be able to read books. So I'm doing one. It's just encouraging reading. And I told the illustrator, I said, I need everybody. I need the blonde right. white boy. I need the yeah. Latin Spanish brown boy. Yeah. And I need the, I need all of them. I need everybody. I need to be, and when they open turn a page, I'm in there. I'm in there. I'm in there because yeah. I, um, because it does make a difference. And the children do determine um, 
the book and they do determine what they're going to read and what they're not going to read. The parents are not picking it. So they want to be able to identify and see themselves. And that whole self-image thing is a huge, huge, huge thing. And fortunately, I had parents who were like, no, we're not going by that. We're going by what's in your head and not the skin on the outside. We're not even going to make no difference. So we're going to take a set, a quick break right here and we'll be right back. And we're back with Miss Betty Baye. You know, I could just listen to her for hours, but, um, uh, and I trust that you um, that are listening will um, continue to enjoy the writings because she's writing all the time and um, in all types of magazines. And oh you my know, gosh, a great historian. As much as I should, I don't know whether, you know, I get these, I get these spasms. It's like I write, 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 write. And then, and then I don't, you know, it's sort of yeah. like everybody's got their moment, you know, people can get up and they say, I'm gonna write six hours today. I mean, oh, you no, have I don't never do that. Yeah, but I I'm never do that. Part discipline. You know what I'm saying? I could have written two other books since we, since you published the other one. And I'm just sitting here and I'm like, so, you know, I've started my book and I was reading some of it because you know, this other book I want to do. And um, in, in celebration of my birthday, uh, of my birthday year, because you'll be celebrating all year. Right. And, um, my cousin, I read to her some of the book and she said, oh, I got the name. I got the name. I said, what? She said, excerpts from a life. Excerpts from a life. Mm. And, and so I was telling her, there's a picture back here. There's a drawing of me um, that a guy did in 1969 in a bar in Harlem. And I look at that picture and I say, who, who was that? Yeah. I, what was I thinking? And I look at my eyes, you know, they, they were so expressive. And I said, wow, that's how somebody else sees me. Mm-hmm. Because how we see ourselves and how other people see us is different. And I just read to her because she'd known me literally my whole life. And I was reading to her about having this, this drawing done, this guy just stumbling in and then going back out into a night, never saw him again and how I've lugged that picture around for more than 60 years. And um, is it 60 years? Well, 50 something, you know, years start running away. Um, but I really look, I look in my eyes in the picture and these stories come to me about who I was then, what, when I was telling you who I wanted to be, I didn't know what I was gonna grow up to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I didn't know. And God just had the way, it's like, You can strain to be something, but if that's not your gift, you know, if that's not what God has for you, it's like it won't let you do it. Yeah. You ever had a book that you wanted to write and it will not write? It was like, "Mm -mm, I want you to tell that story. Right. And it comes out, flows out. I can write it in 30 uh, 30 days and it just flows out. And, you know, and and, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I just did one and closed okay. one the other day because it, because it was the time for it. Now, how it will sell, how it will do, I have no idea. But the the uh, inspiration, energy, and everything flows right. smoothly, quickly. Boom! It's out. it won't let you. It won't let you sleep. Like when a story gets hold of you. Yes. And, you know, I say to people, you know, even if you don't get the whole book, you got to write it down. Yeah, these notes, these things that you have, because when the time is right, the book just comes. And like I said, everybody has their style um, of writing. And I am more like a narrative person. Um, You know, I I do journalism because I learned it, but I think because I grew up with storytellers, people from down South who came to the North and they would tell stories. And I just remember being a little girl being fascinated by the stories they would tell. And I love the way uh, everybody had like nicknames. You know, if you worked in the fish place, there's a guy they called Fish Bill. You know, they right. called my father Blue Eye because he had a cataract in his eye. You know, black folks are just have this magic. And, and sometimes when you're young and you're not trying to be a writer or anything, these stories, they just, you miss them. Mm-hmm. You know? around there with your aunts and stuff the stuff that they would say in front of you because you know, i know they, it yeah because you can't be in grown folks business uh-uh, can't be in grown folks business <laughs> but you listen to them and i think that i am i am a narrative i, I think i'm a 
I'm an essayist. I think, you know, when I did uh, the book that uh, Royston published, you know, the book of David, it was like essays. It was like me writing in these moments. And it's like, when I'm writing, I can hear it. And it's like, I could see it. It's like a movie in my head. It plays like a, like a reel, you know, in my head. And so many of us have stories that we lose and we don't leave anything for the children. You know, mm. you know, even if it's just in your notebook, we are gone. The children will cherish the notebooks. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. I'm okay. and, um, there's all kinds of ways to go at it, but just like Julie, you keep publishing books, you will never run out of people with stories to tell. Oh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced you're exactly right. But it's hard to, um, you know, to find that fine balance because even when people say, I don't know where to start, I don't know how to, I, I want to give you guidance, but I don't want to squash your voice. I don't want to squash the way I, I, I give you options to approach. But yeah. I, I don't want to keep you in a box and say, you can only do it this way. I don't like working with editors like that who say, I, I want you to have an a, opinion grammatically and, you yeah. know, in the noun and, and verb agreement. But I, I, I'm wide open as far as our approaches to it. So um, I think that's good too. And let me tell you, editors are worth their weight in gold. Yeah. But the editors only work their weight in gold when they can hear your voice. Yes. They don't try to take your voice and put their voice on top of it. And that's what I think for you. You were, in a sense, my editor because you could hear my story. Yes. So you, you could help me to shape and think it through. Because when I would say it, it was like you were visualizing it with me. Now, when you have an editor, you got to, to me, I like to put people who love who, who, who love my story. Yes. And help me to craft it because everybody needs an editor. You know, you can't see those. You don't know until after you read something. You say, well, how did I leave that word out? I know. Because and why, what was I even thinking? <laughs> so what was I even thinking right there? The That's word is there. So and the editor can say, well, is there another way to say that? Yes. Uh, and that's what, don't, don't you make it the other way. Yeah. Ask the writer, is there another way to say that? Mm -hmm. You know, just to get them thinking about, you know, word choice and all of that. And I'm, I, you know, and I, I'm sentimental. I am emotional. Um, you know, and I, I, I guess I'm grateful to God because I never had some of the horrific experiences of my friends, you know, my, you know, some of the stories they tell. And I listen to their stories and I'm like, I can't write that because I can't even imagine some of that. You right. know, so put some stuff in books and I go, whoa, because it's so far out of my experience. I'm like, really? So when, when people interview you or when people talk to you, that's what I also tell writers too. Make sure that what yeah. you're conveying in the book, even if, whether it's fiction or not, that's something you have a connection with. Exactly. So that when they meet you, your book is not so far fetched from you as a person. Sometimes, exactly. yeah, we do have to come out of ourselves. Yeah. See, I have a great appreciation for music. So you've weaved music and your love of music throughout the entire book of David. So yes. the book of David not only takes you on your uh, 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 romantic love journey, and, and, and all of that, it also takes you on a journey of music appreciation all the way through mm -hmm. because the beginning of those chapters, there's music, the, the actual title of it, the artist, so that it sets the tone for the chapter mm -hmm. before you even start. And you know, magically, because of technology, you could say, okay, wait a minute, what am I on, chapter seven? Okay, so therefore I'm gonna go and get YouTube and have that song playing while you're reading it. And then that would take it to a whole nother um, physical and emotional level than exactly. just reading the words on the paper. And it's also a hook, you know, like you, like when I was trying to think of how am I gonna enter this story? Because I played so much music while David was dying, I could remember what it made me feel like. Mm -hmm. And so if I say, um, Phil Perry, you know, and I think about a Phil Perry song 
I remember how it made me feel. It helped me to write the chapter. Yeah. Just like in journalism, when they say you go out to do a story, well, what's your hook? What, what is your storyline? Those songs became my hooks. You know, uh, uh, is, it, is it Let Us See song? You know, I blame you mm. because my friend said, you know, when I, when I got with David, it's like, are you walking different, talking different? You're just not the same. Right. So I, I could hear Let Us See in my head. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I could hear that. And so through each phase of our relationship, I remember the first time David and I, you know, spent an evening together and he played uh, La India's version of Teddy Prendergrass's Turn Off the Light. And, um, and so that, that, you know, La Paga La Luz is, uh-huh. is the one thing. And one of my friends told me she took and made a song chapter out of my book and she played every song that I had in the book, she played it. Yeah. So, so that was that was my way of entering it, and I think for writers, they have to figure out how you're going to enter the story because right. we think when we we write about ourselves, we got to start from I was born on. A oh week. my gosh, you yes. You can start at any point in your life and go back. Yeah, and yeah. come forward again. Yeah, you know, it makes it interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm reading Cecily Tyson's uh, biography now, and and Cecily is like telling the story of her and Miles Davis, and I could see them. I mean, I could see Miles sitting on the bench. You know what I'm saying? And even though Miles, they said, was abusive and all of that, Cecily loved that man. Yeah. And, and then one of her last interviews, uh, somebody asked her about, you know, had she ever thought about getting married again? And she like, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> she hadn't found her another Miles. Yeah. And nobody can explain love. And that's why I say, you know, David wasn't every woman's kind of man. He was the man for me. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And so I had to write about him. He was the man for me. Yeah. But I tried to in, introduce into the book also about how, you know, uh, you know, love lives beyond the grave. I mean, David's picture is right up there. He looks at me every day. He's on the refrigerator. You know, he looks at me every day. But what I had to understand was David is gone. And, and whether I even meet somebody again, which is unlikely, the point is, is that what David and I have will always be. Yeah. It will not change. No. And that's the thing about death. It sort of sits there and it's always there. And because I am convinced that David loved me, that makes me feel like I was loved. You know, some, 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 some people never have that. Right. Get that. But I want every everybody, every woman I know too, I want everybody to know that feeling of love and being loved. And it's the kind of love that other people will not understand. They will look and go, well, what's she seeing him? Mm. And why is she with him? And mm. this is, because you don't know their love talk. Yeah. You know, and so a lot of us have to understand not just the love of a man, but the love talk of our family, the love talk of the church, whatever our subject is. Write about something that you love or that you have to hate it and, and then you can to love it. You, you know what I'm saying? There's no right. one way to do it. But I don't like to, I, I don't enjoy books where there's no relief, where there's never any sunlight. Yeah, I don't need that. I don't need that. And if, a, I, if I'm helping you write it, I'm going to help you find it. Yeah, find it. <laughs> like, okay, right. you had all that abuse. Now, hello, hi, Learn. I'll make it. What can you teach? Yeah. What yeah. You said, we never know who's reading our stuff. You know, books go to all kinds of strange places, secondhand stores, they in the bins, you know, somebody die and then, the, you know, the family come in, they somebody pull a book off the shelf. You never know who you're going to touch. The thing is, is to be authentic, even if you're doing a novel and it's made up stuff, you got to make it make sense. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people, um, think that writing is, is, is hard, but writing is really, it is whatever you want it to be. Mm-hmm. And you have to decide, you may not want to publish it, just write. Yeah, I know. And I know plenty of people who have. I've written like five books. Yeah, I said, okay, how many have you published before you came to me? None. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see if we can get something done. So, I mean, you've, you've given us uh, a lot of food for thought and 
uh, definitely a walking history book because I and always have Women's History Month. You know? <laughs> yes, it is. It's Women's yeah. History Month, and so I, I you know, I'm always um, appreciative of your time because um, now I have it recorded. Now I, I have your voice. I know, uh, I know it. I have it. Um, not just from my spending time and and um, assisting me with your book in any way. It's the, still now. Now I have it recorded because we can't go back there and we have to have the images and the, the people who were actually the boots on the ground, actually the people who were there. You're our historian, you're our connection to New York and the Malcolm X's and the connection to the portrayals yeah. by Denzel Washington and all the people in the theater uh, you knew, which is, a, is an incredible, incredible feat. So I got to ask you a last question. So what's next? What do you think is on the horizon for you? Um, I just want to get through this pandemic. I want to be able to hug people and touch people. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kissy, touchy-feely. I'd like to do that. But I would also like to be a little more disciplined, you know, about trying to do this book that I've excerpts from a life. Um, just to share um, some stories. Um, I'd like to do that. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, Julia, I would just like to see what God has next, because yeah. in my experience, I don't know what God has for me. You know, I, I, you know, you plan and God got another plan, you know, you sure do. I may walk in Home Depot and something may drop down and say, you know what, you need to do this. So, you know, you just don't know. But I think I just thank God for the life he's given me and for, you know, 75 years that went like, huh? <laughs> You know, I was a girl and, and now I'm like, I guess a senior citizen. I mean, I am adjusting to the fact that men don't turn around and look at me anymore. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> hey, now, you haven't met the right uh, guy yet. Hey, huh? you just well, haven't you know, met the right guy yet. that it's just very interesting because, you know, um, my dad told me I was cute, you know, and I'm like, y'all don't see me, I'm cute. You know? <laughs> You'll always be cute to us. Um, but, you know, I really don't know I guess the, the, another book is there, but in life, I just want what God wants for me. Mm -hmm. I really, really do. And I really think that God has been so good to me. He brought you into my life, mm -hmm. you know, through a chance meeting through, you know, with Hannah Drake. And I met Hannah Drake through Sadiqa Reynolds. You know what I'm, right. I mean? It's just like boom, 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 boom. And you never know who's walking in the door that's going to change everything for you or make you think differently or whatever. And I just feel, um, and I think, you know, I'm still in Louisville for a reason. Louisville has been very kind to me. Um, people here have been very kind to me. I have noticed though, it's interesting that a lot of my closest friends are the people that I met, I met when I first got here. Mm -hmm. That they're still, you know, in my life. And that, and that you're right, I was drawn to the artistic life. I love Ed, Ed Hamilton, the sculptor. He's a dear friend, Ed and his wife, Bernadette, who just lost their son. You know, Bob Douglas and Laura Douglas, um, Celeste Lanier and her family. And, you know, um, it's just very interesting that, you know, when Christmas comes, my family's not here. I tell them, don't worry about me. Because I, I, I got people here who love me enough to say, girl, come to me. Come to yeah, so, come to my house. I'm alone, it's because I choose to be alone. It is yeah. not because I I live a lonely life. And uh, the other thing that I will tell you that I have always aspired to be, I wanted to be a nice older woman. I never wanted to be mean. I see some older women who are so mean until I'm like, oh God, you don't know who's gonna have to bring you a glass of water. What you say? I I want to I want to be nice. And you know, I look at you. I know you're a grown woman, but to me, you're still a girl. You yes. know. What I'm Thing. And I love interacting with my girls who are now like 50 something. You know, my little bridesmaid. I said, Oh, Michelle, you were my bridesmaid. Michelle said, Cousin Betty, I'm in my 60s. You know <laughs> and I still see her in the little bridesmaid dress, you know, yeah. with my buddy. So I'm just saying to you, Julia, whatever God has for me to do, you, you heard that gospel song, God, whatever you have for my hands to do, no job is too dirty. Yeah. You know, wash the dishes, whatever it is. And I love that song. And I got it on a cassette tape. And I wish I could find it. It's like, God, whatever you have for my hands to do, I'll do it. 
So I'm just asking, what does God have for me to do? Because he's kept me here for a reason. He did. He did. He kept us all here for a reason. But I believe that you've always remained open. I mean, you know, we would need three or four more shows to to get through all the people, the essence and the civil rights and the sister we That's need you and all of that. I mean, you know, all of that. Um, um, the people that you know, I mean, even working with you, um, you know, I'm like, I got an email from somebody from the Washington Post, like, really? You know, <laughs> I turned into a groupie, <laughs> but, but, but I just understand that none of that is, is me. All of that is, is that me being in places when, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like something happened. I'm not going to write a book and make myself a heroine of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's not my story. I have friends who are. Right. And I sit at their feet and say, girl, tell me the story. Now, what happened in Mississippi? Yeah. Let's let, yeah. What yeah. happened in Alabama? I know it. You were on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, really? But you know, it's like after Dr. King got, died, everybody was with him. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Black people hated Dr. King, too. Sure. So I'm just saying, do you hear them now? I was with Malcolm X. It's like, well, like a friend of mine said, you with Malcolm X? How come you ain't dead? Right, <laughs> with him, you know what I mean. Right, and, uh, so it's just a very interesting life, you know. And Betty Shabazz was in my um, was in my sorority. She's a member of my sorority. She was in my chapter, the New York Elite chapter. And my mentor was very good friends with Betty Shabazz. You know what I'm saying? And I can remember the last time I saw Betty in the airport. Uh, you know, she just, but but it wasn't me. It was like I, I happened to be there. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I, Adults, I happened to be in that chapter and Betty was a member and she would come to the meetings. Yeah. You know, this yeah. mentor who chose me happened to be a good friend of Betty Shabazz. So I got to spend time with Betty Shabazz with my mentor. John Henry Clark was a friend of my mentor. And so, you know, she would take me to all these blackity black things. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, ooh, child, I'm meeting this one and that one. And I never dreamed that I would be a writer. You know, I never dreamed that I would be a writer. That I, that me, I remember uh, meeting Alex Haley at the African Heritage Studies Conference. And then like years later, Essence Magazine called me and said, we'd like you to go and interview Alex Haley. And I'm like, what? Okay. This is after Roots and everything. And, and I went to Tennessee. I spent the whole weekend with Alex Haley. He was showing me all the original manuscripts and stuff like that down at his farm. And I, I wrote the article for S and then the very month that they published it, February, was the month that Alex Haley died. The oh article. My Lord. Oh, so my Lord. So it turned out that I got to do one of the last, you know, major interviews with Alex Haley. But it wasn't me. It was right, like. Right, right, right. Can't point. Those are the kinds of things you just like, okay, this is all about. And, you know, I have to confess, this is my, um, uh, that, you know, God said, you know, anything that any level, high level of success, it's going to be through the people I bring in your life and the people, and when it's all said and done, it's like your story. It's like only God could orchestrate that. I mean, who, people will be like, oh, I want that. Oh, I want to meet them. And I, and they spend a lot of money, time and effort and, and underhanded and overhanded things to do. What, and it never seems to work out right. It does. I mean, but if you stay with God and stay humble, it works. It, it works. And I, and I believe me, Julia, I feel blessed that anybody even wants to interview me. Like I said, I'm the girl from East River Projects. All of this is quite amazing to me. And that, um, you know, I, I, you know, I told my homegirls last night on the homegirl call, you know, I, you know, we all know each other's mothers. I said, everything that I am is because of them. Yeah. And, and many of them, you know, they weren't very educated and stuff. And I said, when I had my Blackbird, my book of columns that came out, in fact, it's been 20 years ago. Wow. Um, I called it Blackbird because I said, they outfitted me with my wings and they taught me how to fly. Yeah. And I was able to go places that they were never able to go, wow. that they would not, you know, to the White House and all of that. So yeah. God is amazing. But it's, but it's still though, we, we still needed those shoulders to stand on. Exactly. That, that mother wit, that, that non-book knowledge, sometimes we needed that because what they were teaching us, we weren't going to get in college. 
what they were teaching us how to act and behave and you yeah. know pull your dress down and yeah. Yeah, make sure your lip gloss is on and your earrings and everything i mean that they didn't they're not going to teach you that in and in, in college yeah. and yeah. how to approach how to shake hands how to right. look people in the eye those those basic um giants to me of wisdom yeah and, and my daddy uh, told me you represent the race and that is always in the back of my mind and when you talk about those shoulders i had a line that I wrote in one of my columns and it made it into the Jet Magazine, you know, the words of the week. Uh -huh. and the line was, I tiptoe in high heels through doors kicked open by barefoot people. Wow. I tiptoe in high heels through people didn't have no shoes. Yeah. Oh, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, and yeah, yeah. I just give thanks to those people that God put in my life, that whole experience yeah. of them. And I think about them and I say, Lord, I said, my parents never flew on an airplane. They never owned a house. They never owned a car. And all I could think about when I was walking to the pyramids in Egypt was daddy, can you see me? I know it. I know. Now well, I told my mother, I said, any level of success I have now, my father died in 2010 is that I'm, I'm upset that I can't tell him. She said, oh, he knows, he knows. He's so, yeah. he was proud 10 years ago. They paid you for it. Yeah. They prepared you for it. They you did, see? they did, you know, yeah. they, they, they did. And so it's, it's been incredible. Thank you, Ms. Betty, for taking time <laughs> on your day to, to speak to us. You always give me food for thought and, uh, give me that uh, energy and inspire me to continue to go. And I trust my audience will continue to move forward. Find Miss Betty Baye, that's B-A-Y-E, it's her last name. Baye um, with accent on it. With an accent on it. Uh, and um, find her books, purchase her books and um, reach out to, to her, follow her on Facebook. And if you can't seem to find it, look at me up, Julia Royston, and I'll be happy to make that connection. If your book club wants to have Miss Betty's books, any of her books um, for uh, their book, book club, please reach out to me and we will get you uh, a whole set for everybody. And um, in the virtual space, you can have an interview with her. So that's a beautiful thing too, as well. So we thank you again today, tomorrow, and always. I have a website, BettyBaye.com, yes. but I need one of these youngsters to come. <laughs> I, I <laughs> fix it. it. <laughs> it's it, her website is simply, right. Her website is simply BettyBaye.com. Um, B e t t y b a y e. No, it's not updated, but it's there. No, no, no. It's it's there. So. You all be blessed. Have an awesome day. Live your best life. Thank you. Bye-bye.